Hey everybody, this is Brad Dyke uh, reaching out to you and uh, this particular video is more of an historical video. So if you really want to know the roadmap of how storage capacity came to what it is today, this is the video for you. Uh, one of my uh, not so popular fans came up and said, his name is John, and he came up and said, well, I see that you don't have an understanding of previous technologies for drives. That, you know, that I'm just talking about the latest hard drives. That was correct. That was the whole point of the video, was to talk to the nature of drives that we work with today. But any opportunity to talk about the past, I'm there. So, John, this is just for you, dude. So, what we're talking about here is basically how did computer technologies even come up with the idea of bubble memory? Well, believe it or not, cellulose had a lot to do with that. That's right. Paper. Did you know that the first quote-unquote hard drive-like material that existed that we used to write to in the processes of, um, shall we say, um, just basic 8-bit, that's pretty scary, isn't it? That in reality, the fact that, yes, a long time ago, uh, just before I was born, actually, in 1967, we used to use what's called a punch card punch out process. Now what the punch out punch card process is referring to is the fact that um, we used to use these index card like cards and they'd have a, a particular set of holes in each of them and there'd be tens of thousands of these cards and they're fed into a, an index card reader system. Uh, these were my toys as a kid. My dad would bring them home and there were thousands of them and I would just play with them and have some fun with them and in general, it was really uh, just a blast to have fun. I used to write on them and draw on them. But in his world, you would actually line everything up and you would to go to the process of sequentially submitting them into the system and it would result in some bit-based information. I said bit, not byte. We're not there yet. So over time, eventually things digressed into some other kinds of places and quote-unquote accomplishments. And that is the introduction of these very large, I would say, six foot tall, four foot wide uh, combinations of reel-to-reel -reel data caption processes. This was an analog serial process that would record data. And you've seen them in like recording studios where they do like sound recordings and they can do like multiple sets of tracks and so on. Well, it's very similar to that, but in the old days, reel to reel and another type of capacity that started to exist, which were known as the platter sets, um, that would, would evolve into some really cool, bulky, very heavy, kind of like almost hard drive kind of devices. So with that being said, um, the heavy hitters, the big industries, the governments and all of that had this very expensive gear that would get you so far, right? So over here, I have some of those platters in discussion that which we're talking about. Um, they first started out as, um, besides the weird, weird, about three feet high, two feet, two and a half feet wide, and they were containers with platters in them. This is an example of three platters I use for an inversion field generator. That's right, those are hard disk platters. They're roughly about 12 inches, maybe 13 inches wide. And uh, there are three of them there. And they basically are, uh, the ones that I remember in the big cylinders were even larger. They were closer to 24 inches wide, but not quite. Back in the day, um, these were containers that you would raise the lid of the quote unquote drive system, drop these six or eight platters into the drive system, turn the lid off and take the cover off, close the lid, it would get very kind of a, almost like a vacuum inside. The heads would come out and they would start reading the platters. Now, obviously this is pretty doggone big. I mean, we're talking serious size here. Not only are they serious in size, they're heavy, 100, 150 pounds. So they started developing two standards one known as SCSI, serial computer, uh, Small Computer Serial Interface, and also what is known as RLL. Now, this is for those who played in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, the hard drives 
were still the same size platter like you see here. And that platter is pretty seriously big. I mean, look at my hand. If I put my hand up there to it, you can see how big those platters are. And, um, but they figured out how to put those large platters inside the housing block. And this housing block was about 50 pounds, smaller. Big though, it was about a foot and a half wide, about 12 inches tall. And it still had this large disc in it, but they would spin. Actually, that's where I got those platters from, was one of those. Uh, that was still the same media as the old drop-in cages, but um, I tore apart a 50-pound hard drive uh, that was a SCSI device interface, and uh, I salvaged those disc heads on them. And you should see the O-rings on them. They're huge. They're about that wide. Uh, at that point stage, RLL became something that might be feasible for this new technology coming out from a small company called Intel with an x88. I didn't say x86. I said x88 based processor platform and they came out with these little 1, 5, 10 meg, meg, not gig, hard drives and they were fairly large. Now this is one of those hard drive platters for that and this is a 3.5 inch platter. So as you can see uh, for what little capacity these could hold <laughs> RLL being a very uh, headache of a kind of configuration setup uh, meant that uh, this is cutting edge technology in this new thing called a PS2 computer and it was really cool but if you touch those cables in that RLL controller boom goodbye everything you had to start over reformat and reinstall what you need to do this was also going back to the time where people were uh, loading from floppy disk. Now, I did miss one other type of reel-to-reel -reel, uh, disk capacity-like function. It's because it's pretty sad. Uh, a cassette player for uh, the introduction x86s uh, and x88, uh, x88s, the Trash 80 Radio Shack platforms, would have a cassette player, and that was another form of reel-to-reel, -reel, but I covered the base technology about where to where, and this is about hard drives, not the other forms of media. So with that being said, now we have MFM hard drives out there using RLL controllers, and this is way before IDE ever existed. And this is how we did computers back in the day. Very complicated, highly proprietary, not easy to work with, and believe it or not, memory serves me correct, IDE came out from a proprietary standard with CD-ROM drives. Uh, because they were wanting to add that media to the equation. But back to what we we're talking about. Over time, MFM gave in to IDE, and that allowed the introduction of the, <laughs> the 3.5 inch disc uh, that was out there in the industry. And I have like hundreds of these platters right here for discs from many years. And um, the basic IDE interface started a process called the standardization. Uh, and then EIDE came out, which is the enhanced version of IDE, which gave you some baseline performances. Now, we're not dealing with IDE anymore, really. Not really. Um, or the MF-style floppy controller interface we used to use with floppy disk. A totally different technology, not going to talk about that. But SCSI was also out there in the equation. And as you can see here, SCSI is not a joke. This is a SCSI 3-class connection. We also have SCSI 2 and SCSI 1. These devices are, uh, SCSI 1 and 2, are what we call set divide devices that have actually have to have jumpers set to them for the proper ID so that they don't run over each, each other to accomplish their task. And then at the same point in time, many, many, many years ago, this new standard called SATA came out. And this is a SATA interface, as you can see here. It has the break, and that's important. SAS doesn't exist yet. Um, it was starting to develop, and the reason why it was starting to develop is because SCSI was costly. And just like IDE came out, was to get the cost down. Uh, MFM drives, RLL, is proprietary, it's a pain in the butt. Can we do something similar that does the same thing, but it's cheaper, easier to make, and so on? So IDE came out. 
Fiber channel is another variation of disk communication. It is a disk protocol communication like SCSI communication and like IDE communication. It, it basically is a highly and very effective way of communicating disk-wise, cheaper than SCSI, but more expensive than IDE. And this is where uh, fiber channel technology began to come out. And the interface for ch fiber channel drives is half the size of an 80 pin out for SCSI. Now, eventually EMC and companies like EMC drove fiber channel way out of orbit when it came to costs and made enterprise what enterprise is today. But other forms of technologies began to come in to say, gosh, you know, why is it so expensive? I mean, here we go again, a rinse and repeat process, right? So over time, a development of technology for SAS interface, first it was 3.5 inch and then the 2.5 inch. But if you look here, the SAS interface is a straight edge. See that? No L, no L configuration. If you look at the SATA, it has an L configuration in it. See it right there? Right there, yeah. Between the two edge connectors. So that means basically SATA cannot take SAS, but SAS can take SATA. And this began a very cost-effective solution to avoid fiber channel technologies and be in a more price point wise industry. So with that being the case, hard drive technologies has come a long way and now we're beginning to go away from the modulated stru structural format and going to the m.2 and the mvme style with pci busing and that's a great technology but there's also ssd style interface that fits into a sata connection configuration and there's also don't forget the usb memory sticks and the SD cards out there also, which are viable pathways for capacity. If you don't have the need for certain things, you can really reduce your costs. So it was fun to talk about the past. You see, I grew up on this stuff. I mean, I, my first computer I worked on wasn't a computer. It was a mainframe. It was called a Harris 4000 chassis. And I, I used this little joystick and I would chase the dots across the screen. And when my dad wanted to take things apart on that system to repair it or whatever, I was there with him and we pulled out parts and put things in and I began to understand how things work. Um, all in all, in the total grand scheme of things, the transition from mainframe technologies to Oscar platforms, to Amdahl platforms, to fiber channel environments, to the higher performance style SaaS environments and everything in between has been really my career over 32 years as I retired my mainframe systems to transition to the x86 environments. So this was just a little bit of fun I had. Uh, it's at John's expense because, you know, he didn't think I had that kind of history. And, and most people tell me, don't tell me this stuff. But John, that was for you, dude. I hope you have a blast, John. Um, it's okay. Take it easy. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. That's what this is about. This is the reason why I Try to get people to think outside the box just because it's sitting in a box. Maybe you could sit in a canister or maybe float above your head or something uh, and do something completely different. And so with that being said, I'm going to let you guys go. God bless and have a great week. Take care.